Hello and welcome to a brand new kind of Arsenal podcast brought to you proudly by the Highbury Squad in conjunction with the Gooners podcast. It's a respite from the wins and losses, a break from tactics and talking points, just some good old-fashioned fun, chats and banter with some of the most recognizable faces within our great Arsenal family, telling their stories, sharing their views, and answering your questions. Join us now live as we travel from Highbury to the Grove. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is the first in a new maiden concept from Highbury to the Grove. When I was putting together this podcast, uh, it was very, very important for me to get it kicked off the right way. And uh, we've been planning this for months. But when I figured out that I was going to be here when we went uh, and started this thing, there was never going to be anyone else I wanted to have as the first guest. So welcome to the podcast, someone that I've been very fortunate enough to have on before to meet and just she is Highbury. So welcome <laughs> to the podcast, Amy Lawrence. God, that, that feels nice. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here as always. Spiritual home. Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll definitely talk about the place behind me. But if if for some reason you've been living under a rock for the last 60 years, uh well, I'm sorry, not 60 years. <laughs> I just I just meant arsenal history. I didn't mean Ooh, oh boy. No, See? No, all right, let's start this new podcast all over again. Um you will find Amy You're not from, far away, Sam. Jesus. No, I'm not. And I meant for my lifespan, I didn't mean hers. Uh, you will know Amy from reading multiple books, journalistic works with uh, multiple outlets, most recently The Athletic, uh, from listening to in podcasts, of course. Currently, you can hear her on Handbreak Off uh, on The Athletic, watching her in interviews on stage with various Arsenal legends, of course, movies like The Masterpiece 1989, and uh, of course, definitely the the source and the and the the person who just, again, like I said, screams Highbury in 1989, which is something we share in common, uh, then you will know Amy Lawrence. So um, we'll definitely talk about the, the the place behind us. And I apologize. It was so important for me to get the background of the north uh, of, of Highbury behind us that there's, you know, you can see us in the background. So uh, a little, since the sun has gone down, we've got a little bit more of a, uh, you know, of, of a reflection, but uh the goal of this show, look, there are some great podcasts out there that talk about tactics. You've just watched one if you were watching the Highbury Squad talking about yesterday's game uh, against Brentford and uh, all Saturday's game against Brentford. This is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we want to bring our viewers closer to some of the amazing people like Amy and, and like the others that we're going to have on and provide you to get some uh, of your questions answered. And in fact, because they're questions of guests, we're going to call them questions. I think we can do that. So uh, so we want you to put your questions into the chat um, and we will save them and answer them at the end of the uh, at the end of the show. Uh, spend a bit, maybe 10 or 15 minutes doing that. So just put something in the chat, starting with G. We'll know it's a question and we'll ask it at the end. So um, I have a question for you. Have you looked at the league table? Lately? Funnily enough, it has not escaped my attention. Because I have been too nervous to check recently. Uh, <laughs> can you tell me who's on top? Because uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Do you know what? It's uh, it's a funny one, but 
I, I almost feel like everything leading up to this weekend felt like a kind of part one of this season. And suddenly we've gone into a new dimension. And being where Arsenal are and who they're close to and with what lies ahead, it feel it honestly feels like a, like almost I don't know we've we've gone some quantum leap into a different place a much scarier place a much more potentially exciting place but um, yeah there's a gear change let's be honest there's a gear change that was really crystallised by events this weekend involving all three teams at the top and I think you come away from the weekend thinking there's three. Very serious, very impressive beasts. Doesn't feel like we're we're that. kind of out of our depth anymore. Like last no, year, we were like careening down a roller coaster at Brink well, Speed. Exactly, and then everybody was just clinging on for dear life. And you know, you, it was it was the first time on the roller coaster. It was you know, you're on the ride for the first time. You don't know what's coming around the corner. This time, it feels slightly different because I think there's that little bit more know how. But I still feel, if I was being deeply honest, like obviously you've got to take every point you can at the moment, but I would kind of love to be just tucked in behind. Really? It feels a yeah, bit you're early. Like, you're like me. drafting a little bit behind like they, like they do on the, the Tour de France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to feel like you've got a little bit more in the tank and, you know, the people in front are right in your sights, but there's such a intensity about leading the pack. And it's a hard thing to do without a lot of experience. And having to think about it for the next yeah, three and a half weeks, it feels it, like. It's until great, but it's scary, is my kind of mindset. Yeah, well, I think we're all we're all buckled in for uh, for a roller coaster ride for the rest of the season. And, and you know, I'd rather be on the roller coaster than not be on the roller coaster. Let's put it that way. And we've been we've been standing on the side, you know, with that. You must be too tall. Not, you know, we weren't tall enough to ride this ride. And uh, and now we are, and and so let's enjoy. I it. had a really funny uh, little moment after the game against Brentford. Um, you know, when you come out out of the concourse, and the, you know the team's gone off and giving them the, the the reception, and everybody's you know feeling so much energy, and there's that kind of like flow of people. It's almost like a. Um, uh, uh, you know, d different currents flowing against each other in a really busy sort of body of water of people going in all different directions as they're leaving the stadium. And I, I love that bit in the concourse. Everyone's buzzing and chatting and singing. And it's funny, I came to look at you at half, look for you at halftime yesterday. And I guess maybe you had gotten up earlier. I came down the wrong one, but it was literally just as that goal went in against us. Uh, I, I left a few minutes early, oh. came down to see uh, if you were around and, and, um, poke my head in just in time to see people gasping and a couple people on press road cheering, which wasn't very nice of them. I didn't think they let those, uh, those kinds of folks in there. But. Sometimes, but, uh, but no, I wasn't working. I was, but I was in, well, that, the, in the North Bank. That's one reason lower. I couldn't find you. Oh. And, uh, so we we're in the concourse buzzing around and I bumped into a, like someone from way back, you know, when we used to go years and years ago to matches, got big bear hug stuff, you know? And, uh, he said, if you've been talking to my mate and we've just been saying, like, would you rather win 6 0 or would you rather win 2 1 with a late goal? And ah, all that kind of sort of drama, theatre feelings. And it was brilliant because I, you know, I knew exactly what he was saying. And then I was with my my eldest, who's 16, and he, you know, had that completely different mindset. He was like, well, 6 0, obviously, for goal difference. You know, like <laughs> you're such a practical young man. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I'm not sure that's the word we normally use, but I just, you know, I think data and analysis and all that is such a, a part of how we consume football nowadays. And yet, for me, what I love most is feelings. And uh, but it was a, it was an interesting kind of part of the thought process of how you feel about what's going on. And I think the point about this Arsenal team right now is. We've got to have different ways to do the job. I was just, I was just thinking. I mean, we're we're winning in different ways. I mean, we, which the, is, the six nils which are great. Is. I mean, I'll take them all the time. But you know, you, you need to be able to peel away against a team that's clearly come here just to. I don't remember any heroes. champion, yeah. almost ever, that's done it all as a procession. There's always yeah. some hairy moments, and uh, it's about being able to get through them as well. So that was really a fascinating part of that. Now you. Situation. You did not 
you weren't born into an Arsenal family. Um, Not so really. I, I think well, you kind of the different well, London yes club no. maybe that you were exposed to early. I mean, not really in the sense that going back to the seventies when uh, I was uh, arrived on this planet, um, you know, it, I was walking around the Emirates the other day and I, I noticed that those flags, the sort of decorative flags with players that they've got up, right. had women players on it. It's the first time I noticed it, as well as the men players i thought oh that's new you know that's different and it i come from an era kids where girls just weren't expected to be in any way a part of football as a fan as someone who played like almost in any avenue whatsoever um so kind of i didn't have that much you know my early exposure to football was really limited because i wasn't kind of given it yeah. And my my dad and my brother in our household were QPR were our QPR fans, but it didn't have a major. They switched over even me. for you. I was I mean... No, 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 not at all. Yeah, that's true. Um, you don't you don't do that. You don't no, switch your football. No, quite right too. Um, but the first game that I ever went to, because they never really thought to take to take me, was right here behind us at Highbury, and my best friend. Her dad had three season tickets and thought it was time to take my daughter and I better bring a friend along because in case she doesn't like it, you know, or they get bored or whatever. So, and it was literally like that scene in Fever Pitch. I'll always remember to my dying day, that moment where you kind of almost go from the darkness into the light when you come through the doorway and the, you know. I wasn't going to do this, but. It all opens I up. I'm a person who has to have some notes in front of them. Read this. <laughs> when you watch Fever Pitch for the first time, the scene where a young Paul, a.k.a. Nick Corby, is dragged along to Hyper by his dad, only to have his life change in the moment he set eyes on the pitch. How close was that to your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's great that it, it was weird because that. when, first of all, when I read it, and then particularly when I saw it, when it was made into a movie, it was, it was like, who was watching my life stuff. Um, yeah, very, very resident. But yeah, I'll, we used I'll, to show our kids that movie. I mean, yeah. it, it, it sickened me that that when I tried to find Fever Pitch online, it was some baseball movie. But but we finally found the right one. And and you know, back when we had the DVD player in the car, so that the kids wouldn't cry the whole time, that that was one of the first movies we played. But look, and, I feel like in life, in whatever you do, whatever your passions are, you know, there is sliding doors moments. There is luck moments about the whole thing. And, you know, I always think, who knows if you, Magic Mike, had a hidden talent that you'd never come across. You could be the most sensational canoeist or, um, I don't know. You, Up until recently, that maybe, would have been a very unlucky canoe. <laughs> I have to say. Maybe you would have been, been an incredible uh, painter or, um, I don't know, a, a, a kind of, I mean, who knows? There's like... Yeah hundreds and thousands of things out there that we could all do and you just never know i mean no i, I sometimes look, I, look at things like the olympics and you think how did you figure out that you were you know into the luge you know, or whatever it might be yeah the luge is not it, something it, that you're born it's not in an everyday you're... kind of occurrence you get exposed to something like that and it's like oh, well, i guess if you're born talented. in like in, in like oster sons or whatever or, or <laughs> yeah, bodo maybe. or wherever yeah, those yeah, yeah. Are, but you, you, you catch my dream no, sliding but those even, moments... the, even the things that you, you know people you meet the the, the things that that you, you know you that you connect to in life that can be you know something that's with you in a hugely impactful way and we're lucky enough, all of us in this Arsenal family, that whatever it is, something made us choose it or it choose us. And we're on this particular ride rather than a different one. It might not be Arsenal, it might not be football, it might not be sport. But thank goodness, yeah. I think most of us would agree. I couldn't agree more about the sliding door we're, we're right here. I mean, we we were set to be moved to Cambridge for our two years, and and you know when when I ended up coming over here in the eighties, and at the very very last minute, it ended up being London. Yeah. So I could have had a Cambridge United uh, podcast forty five years later, but uh, no, Just it ended up being London. Could be. Well, you know, I would that would be a miserable life, I think. But nah. so 
the era in which you fully began embracing the club, coming all the time uh, with friends, not necessarily the brightest period in our club with kind of the, the mid 80s time frame, I guess. Yeah. Um, Terry Neal, Don Howe, the, the massive Steve Burton Shaw era. Um, but then seemingly out of nowhere from Millwall, former Arsenal player George Graham comes into play. And, and uh, gorgeous George. Uh, George. Um, not the first time, nor the last time I've seen you together, actually. But um, how did do you recall how you felt kind of at his appointment? And then obviously, oh. you know, we know how those first couple of years went and, and what happened with the team. Look, but I, I think did you see coming what was what ended up coming? Nobody would say that. But I think if you if you are a 12 to 14 year old or whatever, right, like when Mikel started and got appointed, say, for example, and you've gone through latter era Venga in your childhood and then the kind of slightly confused, you know, every experiment, like... That's a good way of putting it. Uh, you know, did you envisage this? Remember when we... I mean, you know, just look back at those early team sheets of... Somebody said the other day, I can't remember when it was, but not that long ago, it was like this was the back four for whichever game it was and it was... Uh, oh, it was uh, 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 Mustafi and yeah. I mean I don't want to I don't want to yeah you don't name names but it you know it wasn't that's the name it wasn't Saliba and Gabriel yeah. and and yeah let's talk about who it was and know, more than who it was because that, that brings back bad memories but 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 I think what what was so exciting about the the late eighties when George came in George changed things overnight and it's funny because there's a you know the whole thing at the moment with Mikel and the fogging his standards yes. you know, which is such a great. Uh, catchphrase George Graham I always thought George Graham's favourite word in a very different accent Glaswegian yeah. standards 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 and he walked in that door and he had standards and he looked around and he wanted standards and it was quite similar in you know to obviously the people when Mikel came who weren't really willing to play ball in the same way in terms of the, those of fog and yeah. the standards um, of behavior and, and mentality and, and devoting yourself and demanding of yourself that you give everything to what's going on here. George was the same. And he absolutely went in and the, you know, some equivalents of waving goodbye to Aubameyang and Urzin oh, and, you know, various people Sands who had, gone. you know, gone, who Williams had big well. names and, and big uh, characters a big history behind them. He didn't take long to work out that this was not who he wanted to work with. He wanted people he could influence, he could mould, he could feel their hunger, he could encourage, he could build. And that's what he did. And what Mikel has done has a similar energy. And as a kid, watching that happen in front of your eyes and watching a team grow from being, uh, you know, a, a, up and down and a bit of, you know, some good times, but some absolute rubbish to into this kind of very credible, very uh, something that you just love and you die for in your, your emotionally that you're so connected with as a fan, you believe in so much, you want them to do well so much. You feel like you're on the journey with them. That was George and, and that team. And, to get and, the and from, from a to do that now, in you know with player power that wasn't the case exactly we didn't have lee dixon uh yeah, you know, yeah, dealing with doing his contract in the on, car yeah, who were on 500 two, quid yeah, exactly i mean you know not even having agents necessarily you know uh, uh and you're going from that to this this huge uh, com industry with uh, these conglomerates and you know billions all over the place and I think I admire immensely that somehow Mikel Arteta has been able to effect in such a a, a very believable way in, a, in an environment that makes it super hard to do so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the you talk about standards or fogging their standards. Um, they are the ones that should have the standards. The social media commentators and you know and radio callers and that sort of thing, their standards 
are not relevant uh, to to the situation. That's where I, I I keep hearing the word standards when it comes to what fans expect and what they demand and what they. Yeah, it's it's. Why? You Why want, do you people want... think that you can do that from the outside? Exactly. I, I say you have no control over the situation, no. so your standards are irrelevant. I know what you want, but now you just sound you know. Anyway, I don't don't mean to go negative on 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 on, but but when you talk about how the game is today, there's so much of that echoing around that it can sometimes maybe if you have the wrong people in charge get into their heads and cause them to take actions that shouldn't be taken. And Mikel, like George, was given the time, given the support yeah, from within, from the people that it mattered yeah. in order to make it happen. And that's that's really what I'm getting at is the, you know, the echo chamber of negativity. You would not have necessarily had that in the mid 80s uh, and late 80s. No. But, so for Mikel to do that in this You might get a couple of thousand people on Avenue Road screaming, yeah. you know, sack the board and shouting up to the director's box if you weren't going to open cfax and see people calling for your head <laughs> no, you know, no no constantly. no there was much less exposure to public opinion in the in the, in the way that it, it is now you know very damaging very quickly in some cases things can explode and go viral and become incredibly tough yeah well we've seen and that. actually i think that it's really interesting that the whole arsenal experience now feels so different to you know when you think about arson in arson out and you think about how fractured the fan base was and how unpleasant and sad it was as a fan to experience your love of the club through that fractured right. prism it was tough you know i mean you could go to any of the games now everyone's you know there is no discontent um, between one fan and his or her neighbor I said, all right, okay, not a lot. I mean, I don't know. I, I, can't speak I, everybody, I know where, well, but uh, there, there is, but it, it's getting a lot less. It's getting a love, lot less. Yeah. Love. And it was, you know, the I, people I, I, I want to be surrounded ago, by. I literally saw people yeah. fight yeah. each other. The people I want to surround them. myself with are exactly what you're talking about. And the, the, you know, so different. The, and, and the loud minority is getting minor, minor, more minor and more minor of a minority. So, uh, what's not a minority, though, is our live chat right now. We've got uh, 350 some odd folks in the live chat. I apologize for being a bit less interactive than I normally would be with a chat. Um, obviously, I'm not typically with my guest physically in the same room. So I uh, hope you don't blame me that I like to focus more on Amy than on the comments. Come but on, give the guys some credit we've got, over there. We've got Sophie and Jared uh, putting up some of your great comments, though, and, 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 uh, and your questions. Um, so are, my eyes are so bad that I'm struggling to read. <laughs> it's okay. We'll put them up. They'll be in big print towards things. the but end of the thanks podcast. Thanks everybody for for all the questions. And and yes, your questions will be uh, will be answered. Tom uh, is one of my best my best mates from uh, from Tampa. He's uh, he's a big fan of yours. By the way, um, I want to mention this because I was just thinking about it. Uh, I have a friend called uh, uh, Jeff Werner. Uh, runs the Boston Gooners Supporters Club, and he he made sure that I mentioned to you. That he is a fellow member of the anything but sweet caroline club uh, and he's from boston where where that song tends okay, to have a okay. connection i i'm a member of that as well i didn't renew my membership so it's made such a difference to my also experience that we're no longer exposed to that monster did you ask that peter that himself to, to to make that uh... i did have words with various people along the way i find that drum um so sorry to people who like it but I'm absolutely thrilled that we don't have it anymore. I think it's it's just between not liking it or not minding it. I don't think anyone actually likes it. I think some people really love it. Really? Do you know who really loves it? Tony Adams. Really? But it was Tony Adams' mum's favourite song. Uh, so I well, get it. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a, a reason. No, there's, there's Jeff. Um, so, yeah, by the way, if you are enjoying the show, uh, as Tammy will tell you, as the chief like officer of, of Highbury Squad, please hit the, the thumbs up button. It helps the channel. If you're not subscribed to the Highbury Squad and the Gooners Pod, uh, please go to both pages, subscribe, hit the, hit the bell so that you'll hear uh, of and see reminders of when we're going to be going live uh, with Sophie's content, with mine. Um, and your questions are going to be, I see you guys are following the rules and starting them with a G. Uh, those are getting saved and we'll be asking those in about 10 minutes or so. Um, speaking of the mid to late eighties eras, and here we go. Sorry. Uh, I've just noticed that one thing I can read is it's all in capitals. Goon 
Jr. Gang, that, AFC. That, it's just that, Ian. Anyone who doesn't like Sweet Caroline hates Tony Adams' mum, which is maybe just kind of like twisting the narrative slightly. A little bit. I do. Have I, to, I'd never I, say a word against Tony or or his family. I do have to point out that he's he's allowed to say that because he's responsible <laughs> for a good bit of the uh, intro video that we just saw at the right. beginning of this. Podcast. You look, you were very purposeful. I noticed. You know? know, do you always walk with such purpose? I don't think, only, I, I don't think I've ever walked that fast in, in my life. Way. Actually, <laughs> you've seen me walk. I think we need to see a sped up version. Yes. Well, we could do that. You know, we could do that. Some Benny Hill music. <laughs> that's yeah. That's usually the soundtrack of my life, but uh, just playing behind me, but. <laughs> We got to get to the late 80s because one of the many arsenal things that we do have in common along with Highbury and, and, and all that is our absolute love and adoration for, oh, well, this actually comes before what you're thinking of. One certain arsenal footballer uh, of that generation over all others. You've called him your footballing hero, which I actually love. I've always answered the question of who's your favorite arsenal player of all time with his name and frankly... You know, I probably have more favorite players, but no hero, no Arsenal man and footballer who's ever had the impact on me that this man has had. But tell us about your Arsenal hero and 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 what he meant to you. Obviously, we're talking about Rocky Rokas. Okay, I'm just checking. You're just making uh, <laughs> um, now, Rocky was... Uh, talking about Perry Grove. A truly, truly special human being. And I think that's the point. It's, we're not just talking about someone who was a phenomenal footballer he was a phenomenal uh, person to be anywhere near um and he you know he had something about him as a again you, you take yourself back to being a kind of a young fan and you're looking at players on the pitch who you sort of identify with particularly and he he wanted it he was so talented and he was so, he wanted it so much he was so tough. There's there's bits of Saka and he that is connected. Um, That's also on the list. But yeah, so it's not it's not. He's a, the first replica, person I've ever seen. But it's, there's a closeness. There's a there's there's a connection between the two of them, uh, sort of spiritually almost. You know, coming through the youth system, uh, being a real role model as a as a as a person that. You can't, you know, in a similar way that it, there's not that many, I think, opposition fans that hate or don't like him. And that's unusual because generally when you play for a big club, for anybody, you know, there are going to be some people out there that are going to just have it in for you because you're an important player at a, a, a rival club. But I think yeah, that's one of, one of, one of our viewers unusual about Bakaya. One of our viewers feels that way about Kevin Nolan all the time. He's saying, <laughs> you know who you are, Fergus, but sorry. Okay, um, uh, you that's a, a distraction. I'm, no, yeah, I, I apologize. That was that's that. all right, but yeah, uh, uh, I think Rob, you horned that in there for that no reason. Thing where opposition, um, fans all kind of really warm to him as well. There was something about me, had a certain charisma, a certain aura. And this was before and, the Euros as well, when you know, when obviously his his profile and the potential for for people to, to to come up with an opinion i felt like he was kind of not looked at as a as, as a bad guy before that either mm -hmm. uh since then even more empathetic of a figure i think that I, I would say one thing though and that's like just generally i think if you i think nowadays there are fewer of those players that you know people really can't stand then it was maybe more yeah. commonplace i think in the kind of 90s early 2000s where there was maybe more personalities at clubs so i don't know like you look at liverpool you know how many liverpool players is an arsenal fan or, or you know do you really think i absolutely can't stand that guy yeah. i mean obviously there are players there are certain players like bruno fernandez and yes. united who kind of generate that kind it's of basically anyone named people. bruno <laughs> at this point because they got one up in newcastle that's pretty oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah as well yeah. Keen on him, and when uh, Mope came on the other day, there was a lot. There's somebody near near us actually turned around and said, "If Mope comes on, I'm actually leaving the ground." And I thought, well, "No, you're not." And obviously, they didn't. But I mean, that's how strongly they felt about it. One um, of the good things that Gwen Dudley did in, in his time at Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> generally it. speaking, I don't think there's that amount of yeah, like villains, if you like, out there. 
I don't know why that is. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, people might completely disagree with that concept, but I mean, it it depends on who your groups are and who your team. I'd be really interested to know thing. how many of the current as I think this is quite a likable team. Like, if you try and remove yourself from like red and white spectacles, right. which is hard to do. But yeah. I can imagine that there are certain players. Mm. Uh, it seems like ben White, they're probably, yeah, so ben White the might be someone that we love. Came to He's mind. our guy. But like, obviously, Arteta is someone who I, I think, oh, we've I, seen I've got that. a lot of friends who support different clubs. They're like, I cannot stand an Arteta. And I'm like, really? Like, you like, like Bob, but you, I, don't you like know, Arteta? Like, well, but he does, he does seem to provoke a little bit of um, Good. animosity in, in others. But I don't, I'd be curious to know your average fan, not even of a major, major club, but your average. I don't know, a Southampton fan or Sunderland fan or QPR fan or whatever. Like, do they watch Arsenal and think, oh, I can't stand him about some of our players? Mm, I don't know. It's a good question, but no one, no one would have said that about Rocky. And, uh, no, and, and, and sure. you know, I, we've spoken to so many of his teammates who, I mean, they bring him up constantly as essentially the, the thing that made them feel comfortable at Arsenal Football Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, him and Janet. Uh, just embracing them. I mean, Alan Smith talks about him yeah. uh, lovingly. Uh, just, just an incredible family. I am constantly thankful that I was able to watch him play football, and more thankful that I've gotten to know his family because mm -hmm. they too, and we we saw them together at the Barbican, which I was going to mm -hmm. mention. Just what a wonderful family! A testament to to their dad as well. Yeah, right? yeah, beautiful, good, beautiful, good people. people. So Highbury. Um, not just the stadium, but the whole neighborhood. Um, and, and it is a neighborhood. I mean, it's in the States where we're used to stadiums being on large com you know, campuses, kind of like the Etihad is where, you know, where there isn't a house within a, you know, a couple kilometers of the stadium because there's too many highways and entranceways and that sort of thing. But I mean, this is, it's a wonderful neighborhood. Um, you, without giving too much away, you, you, you live quite close to the ground, right? I mean, yeah. uh, did you, I don't know when that took place or, or, or when you originally moved here. Pretty much it? as soon as you get to an age where you can kind of choose where it's you live. <laughs> so I'm going to um, be in the neighborhood. It, yeah, that was sort of a, a, a place in the map to aim for. So um, our first uh, first place that we lived here was um, was a house share with, I don't know, was there four or five of us there, mates? And we definitely had some... Uh, pretty uh, bad um mold going on and the house was falling apart a bit but um it was you know it was obvious it was a good place to be and um ever since we sort of stepped foot in the neighborhood as a resident i've not really left so and just go from you know little bit you know little spot to spot but always within uh within very good walking distance now you've told me a story about the first time you came back here is, is that okay to, to talk about or would you rather not oh uh, what well, at highbury yeah uh, sure i mean you know just i was first, really with, upset the, with, with the move to 2006 with. uh yeah, in 2006 in emirates i know you struggled with that and you told me a story that i actually found really heartwarming and and you know has a happy ending so um because yeah. i've spoken to more than more than just you a, a lot of people have said i haven't been back i don't want to go back mm. it's too painful mm. i definitely felt like that to start with and i did have to come back a, a, a certain couple of times for um uh a, a work right. scenarios and i i felt incredibly despairing the first few times that i came back I mean, it'd be hard to explain but to somebody I, who doesn't. at the same time, I was always eternally thankful that, you know, it wasn't raised to the ground and rebuilt as supermarket or whatever, which has happened to many, many other stadia around the country where there is no recognisable sense of it still existing. Um, so the fact that they were able to retain, obviously, the external the beautiful... Uh, spectacular external features and if they Which we see behind yeah us, and if, if anything had happened to them i would have i don't know been devastated um and then the you know to create this environment which retains some of the kind of like it's almost like if you close if you nearly close your eyes properly when you're out there you can still feel the the 
ratio and the dynamics of the ground as it was. I tell everyone that really comes nice. in here to visit that I just, I mean, it's a beautiful courtyard. If you've ever yeah. been in here, there's glass water walls and, and it is and really hedges. nice. Still I would have just feel. preferred the pitch. Well, obviously, yeah, keep the pitch done, with the could, corner you know, flags and all why they, they, they couldn't do that, but you know, no, I mean, I can't see why they couldn't do that because that's what I want. I want the pitch. Yeah. Well, but, if yeah. it was down to me, the it would have been less the expensive Emirates to make pitch. It would have just been a bigger version of this. Like, yeah, but you don't, you don't, you don't seem to mind the Emirates pitch that much. I think. Boy, boy, where'd you get all these pictures from? This was from uh, the oh, media uh, day last year. Uh, that was fun. But you know, look, it's uh, it is what it is. Um, but I, I know the first time you came back, you told me that uh, it was kind of for a family based event. Uh, well, no, there was. A, was that not the there first was time? A, no, no, no. But I had to come back a couple of times and do a few things, and then there was a, 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 the switching on of the Christmas lights right. one year, and uh, I came along to that, and that was the moment where it felt okay again because I could feel the sense of of this sacred spot being kind of alive with a sense of community and people coming together, and that was really beautiful actually. So since then, I felt okay. Well. See, that's that's the story I remember, and it's and it's fantastic. Um, as tends to happen when you talk to somebody as as fascinating and 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 warm as Amy, uh, I'm I'm not going to get to half of the stuff we wanted to talk about. I mean, we haven't even talked about 1989, and we will have to save that maybe for another episode somewhere down the line. But uh, we more than anything in this show, what we want to be able to There's do. There's only so many times we can talk about it, Mike, without people actually think, banging their heads against the wall. I think that number of we times we have to keep. We have to like. We have to. We can talk yeah, about we it. Realize your times. insanity isn't always something to share. You know, it's it's <laughs> we've got to yes. we've got to li we live with it in we, our own personal. We go to uh, doubt minds in the, in the neighborhood. We go to we go to some local uh, group sessions where yeah, we try exactly. to move yeah. past our eighty nine <laughs> obsessions, but um, but we do want to make sure to answer uh, as many questions as we can. Uh, this show is is not just about hearing great stories from great people, but also providing whatever access we can possibly provide to someone maybe you might not if you're walking around in chicago or or stoke on trent or even london you might not be able to just walk up and ask a question to so uh so we're going to go to that now um and let's see one question is are they at the old stadium that's a quick one yes yeah it's just behind us yeah. um we're in a flat that we opened this glass door and we would see the pitch. This was the North Bank. This is the North Bank, which was where, now your first game was in the North Bank, but then you switched no, over the clock? In, no, or is it the other way very first game was in the seats oh, okay. uh, in the oh, West. That, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I was uh, I was a North Banker for most of my kind of teenage years. And then um, when they put the seats in, uh, didn't like the vibe so headed to the clock end which was where it was a little bit more boisterous and that's my spiritual hope well so then we can sing the song to each other oh it's the clock, yeah. the yeah. clock. I'm, I'm... well i usually say that when i'm in the north i can i get you know some people around me are embarrassed that i'm that old and weird but it's fine yeah when when i'm in the clock end which is most of, i was in the yeah. north i was in the north north end uh the north bank for Brentford, but normally I'm in the clock end, like block 25, and and when they sing that song, I'm usually singing with mm. the other side because mm. I, you know, got to you know, got to represent the North Bank. Um, question from Stephen Richards: '89 is an excellent film documenting a great moment in Arsenal history. Is it Amy's best memory as a Gooner? If not, what best? Is it? Uh, that's it. Yeah, I mean, so lucky to have so many, but yes, that uh, that '89 moment was unsurpassed. I don't see how there could be a better moment. I mean, you know, the Invincibles is a pretty what, amazing, though, amazing I, thing, it, but it didn't happen all at once, though. It happened. But I would really, 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 really love, I, at the moment, the last few years, and it's something that happens, obviously, with the passage of time, where now I'm so desperate to win something reasonably big, not so much for me, but for, for the kids, yeah, for the generation that have, haven't had those moments of elation and euphoria. Yeah, my boy started well. watching this club in 2006. I'm so the desperate. Fall of 2006. There's, a whole, there's hundreds of thousands of people out there all over the world. There's people in America who are getting up at stupid There's people in, you know, Australia and the Far East and God knows what, all, but people that make pilgrimages to Emirates that care about the club as much as people who are right here where we are. And I want it for them. And so, I, I have to say, 
happened in the Champions League. I know it, it yeah. still feels like a massive dream. Can you imagine that Wembley? It's the thing that. I'm trying not to. I'm trying not no, to. No, but you know, I don't. I mean, in an old-fashioned way, I think I'd rather be. I'd rather travel. Then romantically, I think to go. Well, Paris would have been happened. the place with Arsene Wenger. Can we not? Yeah. All right. well, so well, speaking of away, uh, away in yeah. Europe now, uh, Dave from California, who, a, I had lunch with today. Realized at lunch, he was the gentleman who snapped that picture of the uh, of, of the. Uh, how do you feel be playing at the Emirates uh, from all the players today? That I think is up to maybe six or seven hundred thousand views now. Um, and if, was if talked about on a back, I'd like to ask him a question, by the way. Go on, you do his question, I'm going to ask one back. Okay. Um, he, he asked, have you spoken in the past about travel? Uh, you have spoken in the past about traveling to European and Champions League away matches by yourself when yeah. you were a teenager. How did you manage that safely? And how did you get your parents <laughs> to say, okay, bold? Okay, well, I maybe wasn't always entirely truthful with my parents. So if you oh, with your parents, I thought you meant with those stories. Rebels, oh, rebels streak, and you just find a way to do the things that your is your calling. Um, but no, I, I, I you just met people along the way. It was absolutely a, a blast. Um, in fact, some lifelong friends have come out of you know going on those trips, and you just you know you see. Do you ever have anyone come up to you and just try to foist a uh, Denver Gooner scarf on you? Just just the one just wouldn't enough. just wouldn't uh, wouldn't give up on that but no i wanted to go back to to, to giant cal Guna because, uh, because that picture which is a brilliant picture um uh of, of all the players coming up with a word to describe how they feel about playing uh playing at arsenal um i i spent i said i feel like i spent too long studying studying it because i i feel like that's one person's handwriting Ooh. Well, the, uh, I'm curious to know that, what other people think. But I'm not sure. You could have had like I, a I just know whether somebody was, was like, what do you say? And then they wrote, okay. Mm -hmm. That's or gotta be did what they it was. all get up and... No, it wouldn't have been that. It wouldn't have been that legend. I think it is one person's I, handwriting. Yeah, so that's the thing. It was like the, the, the minutiae detail that really should Are, you, are you doubting the sincerity no, of, no, no. of the... Uh, no, but that's obviously the, the great thing that we will never know. Is what did Kai Havertz say originally before it got rubbed out? <laughs> what was the first word that he felt he had I didn't to even notice that. Oh, God. Yeah. It was probably ya. Yeah. You know, oh, it starts true. things off with ya. Yeah, but, uh, but yes, thank you to Dave for enlightening the fan base that with that. That was great, great, great sport. Um, Question from Melvin Marks, dear friend of mine as well. Um, hi, Amy. When did you? When did your love of Arsenal and your occupation cross? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I mean, many times in some respects, even still now. Uh, I think it's w when I go to work. The 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 discipline kicks in, and you know, particularly if you're on a deadline, just. Have to, kind of prioritize that um but it doesn't stop me feeling and caring and I, I say one of my favorite stories um is when Carney scored that hat trick at uh Stamford Bridge and I was working that day in the press box and when the third goal went in I proper celebrated and you're not supposed to celebrate mm -hmm. in the press box it's a, a sort of you know code of conduct it's an unwritten rule but you know it's I forget it, what game it was but uh our friend Tom Canton said that uh, that it was 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 it the Villa game where we scored a last minute goal and there were some sort of oh that we kicked off didn't up, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah between like one of the, 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 the press people, people and the staff yeah. yeah yeah and 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 I mean everything was kicking off that, yeah, uh, yeah but I do remember like I said I saw some people that were very happy about uh the goal at yeah, the end of the first half you but, know but 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 uh, Steve Stammers uh, who was a great uh, uh journalist who did a lot of Arsenal and wrote Arsenal in his program notes for a long time. Um, who was at the evening standing, he was a quite a, 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 a sort of a old fashioned guy. He always used to wear a suit and tie and look smart when he came to the game and stuff. And he was next to me that day at Stanford Bridge and give me an elbow. He thought and went, put on the ball, Amy, put on the ball. And I thought, ah. By the way, I, I, I neglected to mention that the questions, uh, segment is brought to you by the wonderful people at zenith coins um have you seen the zenith coins that are out there? these these beautiful keepsakes 
And uh, and and what better time to pre-order a Zenith coin with 10% off? Look at the, uh, the scroll at the bottom of the screen has the has the coupon code. That was a very slick little. Did you see our transition? You know, segue there, yeah. Then and and the, what the but because their new Zenith coin is the North Bank version, and so every time we do a podcast. Zenith is going to come out with a new coin that is a tribute to the location. So my Florida pool will be having a Zenith coin soon when I'm when I return there and do a podcast from there. But check out the uh, the new coin; it's a thing of beauty. So go to Zenith Coins HSNB10 for ten percent off. Uh, we're gonna do one more question if you have a minute, and then uh, and then we're gonna uh, send you off to our next show on the on the Highbury Squad with James from Sky Sports. Sophie will be talking to him about Ben White, um, and uh, it's always gonna be a good conversation. So, question from Des: There are three statues of former Gunner greats outside the Emirates: Adams, Burkamp, and Henri. Um, which player in the current Arteta squad does Amy think has the best chance of joining them and why? And I'm going to add to this. Which two players, arm and arm, should be the next Well, obviously, two? Dave Rokas and, and Ian Wright yeah, have been that needs to be next. kind of shouting about for a while. But um, I'd say Bakayo. And uh, just a quick note that I was fortunate enough to be involved in the consultation for the new artwork around yeah. the Emirates. And there was quite a lot of heated debate about the panel, which has the kind of young players going in as kids and coming out as fully formed, sort of, you know, essentially the, uh, the, the um, you know, from Helen to the future. But, and I, and I felt very strongly that Bukayo needed to be on it. And you take a chance I, that I, someone's I, career doesn't yeah, go the way you think. But it's going. I think that they were just a bit nervous in terms of the time. And what if, what if the situation changed and he ended up going someplace else? And you know, da da da. And I think that I think of all the players we have, might have put up there yeah, ten years exactly. ago, twelve years ago, yeah. Van Persie and Fabregas. And I think that was what that that, that that was that fear is what made it you know difficult for them to commit to it at that particular point when they were doing the artwork. But on my gut, I was like, just do it. You know, he deserves it, whatever. And thankfully, he's still here and he's deserving it more and more and more. Yeah. And I think he's so symbolic of this new Arsenal. Um, and everyone loves him. So, yeah, Bakaya would probably be a great choice. Excellent. Well, thank you for your questions, everybody. 700 now in, in the live chat. Um, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed our time with, with Amy Lawrence. I know I certainly have. A uh, couple pieces of housekeeping. We'll be starting our regular day in time. This is a Thursday evening, 8 p.m. show. Uh, but when you're doing a live in-person show, you do it when you, when you have the opportunity. And, uh, and so we'll be doing that a week from this Thursday, the 21st of March. Um, looks like at this point, not 100% not sure, but looks like we uh, should be welcoming in another universally beloved voice in the Arsenal community, keyword being voice. Someone whose dulcet tones soothe, educate, and enlighten so many in the Arsenal community. And I'll just leave it there. Um, quick note, if you're in the States or if you are planning on traveling over to the States, Gunnar Palooza tickets are now on sale uh, for Chicago the weekend of uh, April 19th to 21st, where we very well may not have an Arsenal game to watch uh, since Wolves just have to beat Coventry now to cancel our game for that weekend. Uh, but we're going to be doing a live podcast, which I'm very honored to say will be uh, benefiting Gooners versus Cancer this year with Elliot from the Arsenal Vision, uh, myself as uh, kind of the host and mediator, and uh, and some other great names, uh, Chicago John, uh, Tim, aka Arse Two Mouse, um, and uh, and a few others. So, um, any last words or of wisdom or or to impart? <laughs> To impart to uh, I to don't our know about wisdom, family. but uh, just to say, it's been a pleasure to chat as ever, and thanks to everyone who's listened in and and, and written questions, and um, just don't get too carried away yet. Like just slowly, slowly, like give it another month, and then let's see where we are. Let's just all try and keep our cool, and hope for a real match to remember. Not just tomorrow night, but next league game, because that make that could make us 
have a real miracle on our hands. So well, let's keep our fingers crossed. Thanks to everybody watching this on Highbury Squad and the Gunners Podcast. And we look forward to seeing you again as we travel from Highbury to the Grove.